We get a link. Come over here and say hi. Show me what. Mm -hmm. Hang on. Cool. <laughs> All right. So hopefully, you guys had a good time studying last night. Getting your OCAM under control. She said, hey, little dude. Hey, little dude. He's my TA. <laughs> Does that mean he's doing the grading? He's my TA? <laughs> you gonna do my grading for me? Grade some OCHEM? Um, that's mommy's job. That's mommy's job? <laughs> well, I think she said it, can do she it. She said it's, it's, it's hard to find good help. I think Chloe can do it. Chloe can do it? She said, give us full points for everything, Kristen. He, he's gonna pass up the duties to, to the cat. <laughs> I can that he can All right, so um, I originally was gonna go over that num number three question from the worksheet, but I answered it in the Discord. I also kind of went over it a little bit. Uh, Chloe's my cat. <laughs> she's down there, asleep. Well, she's awake now, but yeah, that's my cat. Kristen, she said she'll play Roblox with you if you give her an A. My, no, 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 not all cats. My cat is awesome. She's like a dog in a cat body. She follows me around like dogs do. Cats, cats are jerks if they're not trained properly. So I ha I have I have I've always had this theory that uh, cats are actually the rulers of the world, not humans. Because if you think about it, if you have a cat, you're you're pretty much their servant. My cat can actually draw. I'm not so yes, I I am of the belief that cats actually rule the world. We don't. Also, if the if the Earth was flat, uh, they would have knocked everything off by now. So. What. They've seen this before, Tristan. A, a no, few times. I mean on the back. Oh, but oh. I can actually draw. There, there's your A from Chloe. A from Chloe, right there. Oh, that's not what I thought. Yeah, that's not what I thought. <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah. Yeah. All right. So, um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm telling you, your cat is run is running your household. All right. So, uh, let's just go ahead and I'm gonna switch over here. And start talking. So uh, last time we, or two times ago now I think, we went over this reaction. I showed you generic one propene, and then if you react with HBr, uh, we get this product. I'm not going to do the mechanism here right now, for at least for this one. I'll do it for the other one. It turns out if you add peroxide, you get anti-Mark addition. So just so you're all clear, it's Markovnikov is the full name, but I like to just call it Mark Edition, just for short. So Mark Edition, and then it turns out that if you add peroxides to this, so HBr, and then uh, this is written a couple different ways typically. I'm going to show it as R R O O R. That is a peroxide. So it's a hydrogen or organic peroxide. It turns out that uh, these can react in a certain way, uh, generating this product as the major. So it works out that once again here, if you add peroxide to these, you end up getting the anti-mark addition instead. <clears throat> 
That means that the, the hetero atom goes less substituted this time. And I wanted to go over uh, why this occurs. Uh, we're going to be looking at our first radical reaction here. Uh, so if you guys remember from your freshman chemistry, maybe, maybe not, but a radical is a compound that has an odd number of electrons. It turns out that if you have that odd electron count, it makes them very reactive. They want to fill that, that, that orbital up. They don't like to sit that way. So uh, what happens? You guys uh, may, uh, you should have learned this uh, in 122. They typically go, do it during the environmental chapter when they go over ozone. It turns out ozone can also undergo a radical reaction. All right, so a few comments here before I start is I do want to mention that the oxygen, oxygen bond and peroxides breaks easily by homolytic cleavage. So I believe I use these words briefly, probably the first or second day of class, it was very early, um, but heterolytic means, uh, hetero means different, lytic means split. So different split, uh, that's what we've been doing so far all the semester so far. We've been doing all heterolytic cleavage. Homolytic cleavage is where you have equal split meaning that one electron goes to each atom. Uh, heterolytic is where two electrons go to one atom, giving you a plus and a minus. In a homolytic cleavage, you get one electron each and you get two radicals instead. So arrows today, let's do orange for this one. So uh, watch how I'm uh, drawing these arrows. They are half arrows. So I'm using a half headed arrow there, half headed arrow. And let me just make sure we're clear here. I'll draw it down here when, when I'm kind of drawing. Uh, something called the fish hook or half arrow. So half arrow for one electron movement. We've been using double headed arrow so far for two electron movement. This is for one electron. So one goes to each. And then what you end up with is two radicals, like that, R O dot. Um, if, you're, if you're specifically using uh, hydrogen peroxide, you get this radical, which is called the hydroxyl radical. Hydroxyl radical. All right. <clears throat> So if you think about it, uh, this hydroxyl, rac hydroxyl radical is actually a lot more reactive uh, in the grand scheme of things than say the hydroxide ion is. And the only notable difference here is that it, this has one less electron. The thing is though, this thing's gonna wanna be hydroxide. It doesn't wanna be a hydroxyl radical. So it, it can grab an electron from anywhere. And they typically grab them from bonds, from other compounds. Uh, you guys have probably heard about uh, things like free radicals in your body and things like eating antioxidants helps prevent these hydroxyl radicals. Yeah, or the free radicals. Uh, they're typically specifically referring to a hydroxyl radical. So you guys have probably heard of these uh, in the general media as a free radical. These definitely are bad in the body. They can react with things like DNA and cause all kinds of fun stuff to happen. Um, your best to eat, uh, there are certain types of foods that can contain naturally occurring antioxidants. And you think about an antioxidant, this is an oxidizer. Peroxide is an oxidizer. They're basically neutralizing the oxidant that forms from it. All right, um, the way we get this to happen is uh, H nu. We have a new symbol here that we're using. You guys may recall from uh, freshman chemistry, either with an equation, E is equal to H nu. Uh, this is basically the organic shorthand for the word light. So it's irradiated with light at a specific wavelength. So if you ever see H nu over, over an arrow, it's saying light does this. You guys may have seen uh, in the chemistry lab, we, we oftentimes have things in brown glass bottles. And typically that's done because whatever chemical is inside is light sensitive, meaning they can undergo an H nu reaction. 
to, they're usually a decomposition oftentimes. But yeah, organic compounds, some of the larger organic compounds are prone to uh, these kind of problems. But anyway, uh, this step here, uh, where we're forming this first step here, I'm gonna use a different color here, but it's called initiation. So the formation of your radical is referred to as initiation. Uh, I'm going to show you what can happen first, what, happened, what, what can happen with an alkane, and then I'm going to show you what happens with an alkene. All right, so if you have some kind of generic alkane CH, oops, let me just have a generic line there. It could be anything there, it could be H, it could be carbon, whatever, just some generic CH. And we're gonna say this is an alkane CH. What can happen here is that, actually, I'm gonna show you what, oh, with a different one here. So another possibility that can happen with a radical here too, can be bromines can do this also. Sorry, I'm going to show you here that bromine, radical, uh, bromine uh, can be also become radicals too very easily. Uh, I want to use bromine in this, this example here, not, not the hydroxyl. Like that. And then sometimes I'll circle them, just like having circle our pluses and minus. People don't typically do that, but I like to do that, just so it's clear. All right, so suppose you generated some of this bromine radical uh, this can react with alkane CHs. And this is kind of a funny arrow push, but uh, H is going to be bonded to bromine. And then the other electron in that bond goes to carbon. So we're going to generate HBr and then a carbon radical. Like that, plus HBr. So if you have a situation where if you have a, a radical inducing the formation of another radical, like a different radical, that's referred to as propagation. So propagation. So once again, if, if a radical can make a new radical, that is propagation. And then we can have a variation of termination steps. Termination is when you have two radicals coming together and forming a new bond, and then you have no radical on the product side. So two radicals make a non-radical. So there's a couple of different options that can happen here for termination steps. And I'm gonna show you uh, the different variations. Um, basically it's all possible combinations of radicals coming together. Uh, the main one that we're looking for here would be the basically swapping out an H for a Br on the carbon. So that could be a termination step. And then you could you could have also had where two bromines came back together, basically going back to elemental bromine. That's a termination step. Two radicals become uh, neutral. And then the other possibility is where the carbon ones come together. So typically these kind of reactions are not very useful. Uh, they're kind of messy for uh, alkane reactions. We, we typically put bromines on different ways because of how messy this gets. Uh, so once again here, uh, all three of these are examples of possible termination steps. Keep bumping the paper. So the, the whole scheme is initiation, propagation, termination. Are there any questions about these radical reactions so far? You should have covered this in freshman chemistry minus the arrow pushing. They should have just showed you the actual products, but, they, but no arrow pushing. They typically go over uh, ozone, and they typically uh, usually go over how CFCs can affect the ozone layer, that kind of thing. 
they they do initiation, propagation, termination during that during Chem 122. But like I said, without arrow pushes. All right, um, I want to show you now. Like so, now we have a little bit of the background on how radicals work and how they can do this crazy chemistry. Um, I do want to go ahead and take a look at how these react with alkenes, the part that's relevant to the chapter. Uh, there are two reactions here I want to go over. All right, so yes, initiation, propagation, termination are the three steps in, in pretty much all radical reactions. Typically, the propagation keeps going until you run out of material, oftentimes, too. All right, so uh, earlier we had, this is, I'm just going to use a hydrogen peroxide for this one. H nu. Like that. Uh, you also may see this with heat. Heat does this also. We get two hydroxyl radicals out of this. You could write it as OH dot. Just make sure that the dot goes on the oxygen if you're going to write it as OH. Make sure the dot goes on the correct atom. Oh, that was a repeat statement. Okay. All right. So uh, then what can happen here is it can react with alkene. So uh, here we, uh, we have a similar issue that we saw back when we were trying to decide with the acid-base reaction, like where does the H go? Where does the plus go? Uh, same thing here. We have the same situation. Where does the H go? Uh, where does the dot go kind of thing here? <clears throat> All right. So here we're going to have hydroxyl radical it's going to hang on a second let me get lost here oops jumping the gun here a little bit guys sorry sorry but sorry sorry this is what happened with all my notes from my office <laughs> and I, I can't go there because covid sorry I, I skipped a step I'm sorry. I was like, this is not going to work this way, guys. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, first, the uh, hydroxyl is going to react with HBr. So we're doing the anti mark addition reaction here. Uh, where? Plus or star? What are you talking about? Here? That is a dot, a single dot. Odd electron. Yeah, so once again, if your compound has an odd electron count, it's referred to as a radical, these are very reactive. Is that, I'm assuming that's what you're asking about. Yeah. Yeah, I, and like I said, I like to circle them so they stand out just to make sure that you're clearly seeing that that's a radical and not just some random lone pair that you forgot to put second, the second dot for. Yep, exactly, exactly. All right, so uh, sorry about the, so I was jumping the gun there a little bit. It's actually the BR radical that does this step, not the OH one. So in this step here, uh, the hydroxyl radical will react with HBr, and it's going to generate a bromine radical, like we saw in the last example we were doing. So we're going to get water. This is just water. So we have HO forming bond to H in water, and then we get the bromine radical. That is a propagation step. Most of the mechanism is going to be propagation in a lot of these too, if you're doing a multi-step mechanism. All right, so here's the tricky part. So uh, here we are, we're going to have one of the pi bonds is going to form a bond to bromine. And then now we, now we have to make the choice, uh, whichever one, whichever carbon the bromine goes to, the other one gets the dot. It turns out that if you have an atom that are, has a, a radical in it, it's technically electron poor. And it turns out that radical stability matches exactly 
uh, carbo cation stability. So you already know the order for stability for, car for radicals. So I'm going to add this note here. Radical stability matches carbo cation stability. Both are electron poor and stabilized by conjugation. Hyperconjugation. Alkyl groups. Sorry, a messy handwriting there. That long of a sentence to write, but there we go. So it works out where the bromine is going to go less substituted. The radical goes more substituted. So we are going to net get an anti-mark addition. So the bromine goes less substituted here because of the formation of the more stable radical. I'm going to draw the other radical so we're all clear on the same page. This would be the other one. Like that. And then just like carbocations, this one's secondary, this one's primary. This one forms, I need a green, I realize I don't have any green. I'm going to Office Max today, so I'll get some green pens today, if they have them. So that one forms, this one does not. I'm going to put a red X on that one. All right, so just like we saw with the carbocation stuff, now because the radical, because of the way the step works, you what ends up happening is bromine goes less substituted. All right, so I'm gonna go start from this one for the next step. We have just one more step to go, I think. All right, so uh, after, at this point, uh, the water that we generated earlier, we can show that. Hmm, look at this here. We're, we're, make, we're making a hydroxyl radical again. That's odd. Didn't we just use one of these earlier today? Like in this, in this mechanism, didn't we just use that earlier? Hmm. Yeah, so here we showed a uh, first step here. Sorry, I'll, I'll put the whole thing up here in a second. We showed it being made. And then here we showed it being, you, or, or, uh, being used over here. We used it here. And then we remade it. So the question I have for you guys is what is the, what would you say that, that how would you classify the hydroxyl ra radical if, it, if we showed it being used and remade? If a compound is used and then remade in a mechanism, what do we call it? I talked about this last time. Yep, exactly. It's a catalyst. That's, that's the kind of thing that's lowering your activation energy. This is the alternate pathway that we're drawing. So if you ever, remember, if you ever have a mechanism that involves the use of a catalyst, you must show it being used and remade. Used, remade. It goes in a cycle. That's how it all works. All right, net result, anti-mark addition. Uh, the other one, uh, anti-mark addition, I wanted to go over is not a radical mechanism. Uh, pretty much if you have peroxides, they're gonna be radical mechanisms. The other one, uh, the mechanism you probably have seen if you watch the videos already, um, but I did not wanna go over it here. Uh, just like we saw with the oxymercuration, with, uh, approaching it the same exact way, is I want you guys to do have the intermediates because it's, it's just like that one, the oxymercuration one is a two-step process, and I want you guys to be able to do the middle part also. So just like the last time, I'm going to go ahead and use the same one here. It turns out for this reaction we need. Uh, hang on, let me, I'm not going to. I'm not. I will, we'll run a mole equivalent, in the, and we do the do the do the breakdown. But the, the radius for this one here is, you may have seen it in the notes already, BH3, THF, and water. Actually, just say BH3, THF, that's good enough. I do want to uh, mention that there are alternatives to this. You may see it written as B2H6. 
It turns out that these uh, re can react with itself and make this. Or uh, this is actually the, the modern reagent we used. I forgot what that stands for, but this is the modern version of BH3. Is 9BBN is what's used nowadays. It's basically a, a less reactive version of it. And it turns out the next step is an oxidizing step. This is an oxidizer, H2O2 NaOH. That is an oxidation. The first step does what's called a hydroboration. So there we go. We now have the name of the reaction. It's, it's literally hydroboration oxidation is the name of this. And what you end up getting is anti-mark addition of water with a syn addition. This is also syn. So notes here are it's anti-mark addition. Let me put a little asterisk. Addition of water. It's also syn. Like so. All right, so uh, to run this reaction here, it turns out that uh, BH3 is electrophilic. Uh, I, I don't want to do too much of the mechanism, but it works out where uh, we need three mole equivalent of the alkene to one mole equivalent of the BH3. Oh, by the way, THF is a solvent. I don't think I've actually drawn it out for you guys before. And let me do it down here. THF is a, uh, basically it's, it's ether, but it's a ring instead of a straight chain. So this is tetrahydrofuran, THF, like that. Very common organic solvent. All right, so uh, what happens here is it's gonna trade out, um, if you watch the mechanism video, you'll see, but it basically trades out every single BH bond for a B carbon. And it turns out the carbon that it's going to choose is the less substituted one. So on this drawing, this drawing is going to be crazy here, but I'm going to highlight the new bonds just so it's crystal clear. Yep, so uh, let me use um, at least purple for the new bonds. Is that showing up well? Purple? That's not showing up very well. Maybe you're seeing it. I think it looks different enough. So basically new bond, let me make them thicker. Maybe they'll be a, a way more obvious than what I'm talking about here. So new bonds and then less substituted to, uh, we got the three carbons like that. This intermediate is called a trialkyl borane. All right, um, the next step here is this, basically uh, the oxidation step. Uh, just like we saw, uh, or similar to the mercury one, uh, instead of trading it out for an H here, uh, the oxidation step is going to trade it out for an OH. So, so here's step two. Hydrogen peroxide. All right, and then we get three mole equivalent of the alcohol. So typically in this reaction is run, they don't, they don't typically run it with a you know, catalytic amount of the BH3. They'll add, typically add it in like a molar quantity, not catalytic quantity. So I imagine like the catalytic amounts when you're doing like the little the sprinkle in there. And then if you're putting a, a molar amount, you're kind of dumping in there, you know, roughly speaking. Yeah, you would have saw in the lab that organic chemistry, uh, I say pinch and dash and handful a lot of time in there. It's, it's, it has a lot in common with cooking, the way we do uh, organic chemistry in the lab. Uh, there's actually, there's, it's definitely an art form. You don't follow exact recipes all the time. Same way as the kitchen. You, uh, if you get good at cooking, you don't typically follow exact recipes all the time. So yeah, a lot of similarities. 
All right, uh, we are technically done with the with the exam content now. So um, I was thinking we could do a couple problems. I, guess I answered number three. I did. I mentioned a lot of this worksheet already. Uh, the two point three. Um, I did want to maybe. Yeah, I wanted to work on uh, number fifteen on the worksheet. Uh, two point four. Actually, I'm gonna go through a couple of these here. So uh, let me go ahead and set up a view here that I wanted to use for this. Yeah, <laughs> you guys should be done with 2.3 by now. 2.4 should be the one racking your brain right now. Oh, come on. All right. Yeah, 2.4 where, is where this class gets real. Like this this is a pretty uh, hefty worksheet. Uh, what is it, like 10 pages, something like that? Yeah, it's pretty hefty, this one. All right, but I did want to work on this one. So this one here, I gave you a, co uh, a, a starting compound. And then what are the products from all these things here? Um, some of the reactions here I did not, uh, or I'm not going to be testing you guys on, but I'm going to give you the answers anyway. Uh, I know there are a couple of you that are trying to prepare for 241 for the fall, and I want to make sure that I'm serving the, the, those students also. But I, I'm just going to make sure that I'm letting you guys know which ones we are not cover I'm not going to put on the test for this class. All right, so I'm thinking a good way to do this would be for me to pull in my doc cam and then put it over here somewhere. Actually, I'm just going to replace my face and, and, you, and have the doc cam instead. Yeah, there we go. And I'll just write really, really big. <laughs> so I filled up that little space. All right, uh, first one here is, what is that? Uh, let me make it, hang on. make it a little bit bigger. And I can move it around too as needed. All right, let me just hide my face. All right, yeah, there we go. All right, so the first one there, HBr and peroxide. We just covered this one. So this is A. So anti-mark addition of Br. Um, B is that looks like ozone olysis. So you got to make sure that you basically get double bonds to O instead. I should make this a little bit bigger. So ozone analysis. So basically, instead of having double bond to O, it has double bond to C. Uh, this is different from permanganate in that we get uh, we have the H still. If that were perm permanganate, we would have OH. Uh, your side product here is a one carbon. that. Um, I do want to mention here that if, if, if this were ozone, sorry, the permanganate reaction, you get where you get the full oxidation, you get a carboxylic acid, but the one carbon fragment becomes CO2 uh, in the permanganate oxidation. All right, um, number C, this is Markovnikov addition with a carbocation rearrangement, and your nucleophile is going to be water, not, not Cl, because it's in water. So once again, addition, uh, this is a hydration with the rearrangement. Look at that. Uh, D, so uh, potassium terpetoxide, uh, that was the bulky base example during the E2 chapter. So we, we used that as a base for E2 eliminations and we don't have any acidic H's. So you're gonna love this one. It's no reaction. Yes, that is a possibility. So D is no reaction. E is saying um, HBr in uh, organic solvent followed by NaOAT. So that looks to me like it's addition of HBr with the rearrangement um, because of the fact the double, where the double bond's at. Uh, then NaOAT, which looks like an E2 elimination. 
safe def product. So uh, first product here for the first reaction is going to be this. And then the second product is a safe def product here. Most stable alkene. So this one is the answer, the lower one. All right. Uh, let me see if I can zoom in more. Next one says peroxide initiator. Uh, we did not go over this. We are not going over this. So this is one of the ones that I want you guys to not worry about. So I'm going to put an X by F here. Um, but there are, like I said, a few of you guys are preparing. This is a polymerization reaction. So what we are going to get is... I'm not going to go over what, uh, why. <laughs> Just take the answer and go. And then you'll have it in your notes for going on next semester. So let me double, let me just fix this real quick. Double check. Yeah, we got an isopropyl coming off. Okay. Pretty much that. And then it's polymerized, meaning that you have many monomer units stuck together. Or you make like plastic out of this stuff. Uh, we didn't go over G either. So I'm going to put an X on this one. I did want to mention, though, that this was... I did mention briefly during last time that there was a better way to do the permanganate reaction. Th those are the conditions. So you get the same as cold permanganate. So G is same as KMNO4 cold. So we're going to get the dihydroxylation, two OHs, and in syn addition as well. Same, exactly the same, syn addition and everything. Uh, H is another reaction we didn't cover. So that's MBS bromination. So it works out uh, for NBS. I mentioned earlier today that there was a better way to do uh, brominations on compounds. NBS is that method. So the first reaction is going to put a bromine in the allylic position, which is here. The second one is a base for uh, a bulky base for E2 eliminations. So final product is that. Oops. And then the last one here is Br2 followed by NaNH2. This is this one is definitely fair game. So uh, oops, yeah. So the Br2 is going to be. The bromination reaction, we saw that one. All right, so what happens here if you have excess NaNH2 is uh, first you will generate the alkyne. So basically it does an E2 two times. E2 times two is what happened there. <laughs> so yeah, E2 times two. And then if you have excess, this can happen. You deprotonate. That is called the acetylide ion. Let me zoom in on this one. I want to talk about this one a little bit. Acetylide ion. It is nucleophilic for SN2. That is, a nucle that is an SN2 nucleophile very, very commonly used. And I'm going to do a problem using it. All right, uh, before that, is there any questions here? Number 15? Number 15 at all? All right, um, I'm going to do one more in the worksheet here, and then, and then I'm going to show you guys a few other little things, and then we're going to call it a lecture. So we're going to run like normal time today, it looks like. Uh, it's going to be a short lecture today. We're still going an hour. <laughs> yeah, my ver uh, if, if you guys ever had me in like a real lecture, or like in class lecture, the, me... Me letting people early was basically uh, like two minutes. <laughs> you got to go early that day. I almost always use all the clock in, in, a, in a regular lecture room. I like to run my mouth, I guess. That's why I went to teaching, right? All right, so I'm drawing out this one. This is a funsies one. Uh, I do want to mention that I don't typically give ones this challenging in 220 on the test. 241, oh yeah. <laughs> but 220, I don't give them this hard. This is meant to be like a challenge question here. 
So this was the ozone question. It was O3, ozone, followed by dimethyl sulfide. You know what? I just realized I did not tell my dimethyl sulfide story. I always tell this story. Okay, so here it goes. I got, I, we're going to pause for a second for a little story from when I was in grad school. It's funny. So I was working in graduate school. Um, we're working in a lab, and uh, this lab was the uh, the built they they put us in the geosciences building, so it was like all the environmental science people. Forestry was in there. Remember, I was in Montana, so they had a forestry department. It was actually one of the biggest departments on campus. Well, anyway, we were the only chemistry lab on the, uh, even in the building, and my colleague, uh, my you know lab mate, was using this stuff, and he put it and the solution he used he put it into a rotary evaporator. And the smell of dimethyl sulfide permeated uh, into our lab and then out into the rest of the building. The entire building smelled like dimethyl sulfide. And in case you guys have never, uh, you guys have, you guys I know for a fact have all personally smelled what dimethyl sulfide smells like. So the funny thing is, a dimethyl sulfide is the reason why shit stinks. So yes, it is the smell of fecal matter. Is this stuff? So imagine our lab permeated that smell all across th that whole building. So when that happened, our boss told us to, <laughs> he told us to go ahead and, you know, call it for the week, whatever, come back. And we, we went back and uh, we, uh, so we, we abandoned the ship for a week, came back and there were, there, our door was covered with post-its <laughs> saying, we know you did it. We know you did it. <laughs> it was hilarious though. We thought it was so funny. We got called out on it. There were a lot of, we had, I, I even got angry emails from other professors in there asking us what we did. But yeah, that stuff, hopefully you guys never have the luxury of working with this stuff. It, it literally smells like poop. Uh, anyway, um, so what I did here first in this problem here is I broke up where the fragmentation is going to happen. Um, you can effectively just draw draw little O's there. I should have that last thing put little O's in there to show like where basically that, that's how your compound's gonna be. And then uh, I don't accept this as the answer though. You have to redraw it. So yeah, I will not accept that. The just little O's in there as a acceptable. So the way I approach this is I look for distinct portions, uh, like distinct parts where it's actually gonna break apart. So like I am seeing a fragment here that is one, two, three, four carbons. We have another fragment down here, one, two, three, four, five. Continuous carbon chains is what I'm looking for, guys. Continuous carbon chains in there that are not gonna break. And then we have the one carbon fragment here. So I like to label them as A, B, C, and D, or just use letters to label the different fragment pieces. So there's fragment A, fragment B, fragment C, and then just redraw the three fragments over here. So once again, we have one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And then carbon one from this way has a uh, aldehyde group. And then we have our ketone over here. And then we have another formaldehyde. Sorry, aldehyde. That is fragment A. Fragment B is one, two, three, four, five carbons. One, two, three, four, five. First carbon has your aldehyde group. Second carbon has the ketone. Next carbon, CH2. Next carbon, ketone. Next carbon, aldehyde. That is fragment B. Uh, fragment C is a one carbon fragment, and this is not oxidizing, so we have just formaldehyde. Am I missing a methyl group? I am. I can fix it. Yeah, I think there was a methyl group here, right? Yeah, I missed that methyl group that you're talking about. Yeah, so all that does, it makes this, just erase that H, <laughs> and there you go. There. Fixed. But like I said, I, I, uh, on a, on a ozone analysis question for 220, I typically uh, don't give the ones this difficult. But uh, this is usually like 
a normal for a 241 exam for those of you guys moving on. All right, um, I wanna show you guys uh, something here. Uh, there's a stereo chem consideration you have to think about when you're doing things like sin versus anti with double bonds. And uh, if you're alkene, uh, hang on, let me just, just show you here. All right, so uh, what I wanna do here is I wanna go ahead and start from, let's go ahead and say that I have this compound and I have this. And this is a synthesis problem, guys. So basically we're gonna have to figure out how to make this stuff. Uh, the condition here is these are the only carbon sources. So I can't get carbons from any other sources. And the other condition I would give you guys is any reagents. Any reagents you can use. And what I wanna try to make is this. So this could be a tricksy question. Uh, we have to utilize one of the new, uh, new things we talked about today. So what we start off with for this problem, so basically what I wanna do is uh, I wanna turn this carbon into a nucleophile and have it do an SN2 with this. It'll make sense when we see what, what, uh, what happens. So BR2, we saw this in an earlier problem today, that. Uh, I'm going to make the acetylide ion, which is really good for SN2, by saying excess NaNH2. Remember, this is where you got the, du you got the double elimination followed by the deprotonation. Like so. You then treat this with the methyl bromide. This is an SN2 that happens here. And now we're on the hard part of the problem. We gotta figure out what the next step is gonna be. So let me show you the, the two uh, possibilities here and I'll see if you guys can help me pick out which one was the right one. So uh, one option would, uh, so in order to get uh, these bromines on there, I have to first reduce this down to an alkene. So the ways to do that, if you remember, were H2 and Linlars. That gave me this. And then the other option was, uh, I showed you guys two different ways for this, but the one I'm gonna go with here is metallic sodium and liquid ammonia. Gives you the trans alkene. And the next step is BR2. So the, the question now here is which one gives you the target? That's the target, we want this. So let me draw the target down here just to make sure. So this was the target. Hang on, let me see, a, I saw a question in the chat. Uh, the question we're working on right now is out of Orm Ward's brain. I'm just making stuff up. This one right here? Is this one of the problems? I just do this one from memory. Let me see. Uh, sorta. Yeah, you're gonna use the stuff from this one in 20 and 22. Yeah, it's, tw it's, it's, it's helping with 22. It's not exactly 22, but it's helping with 22. All right, so, I have, we, so we have a, stereo, a stereochem problem here, guys. So I want to make sure that these bromines are pointing in these directions. So basically, I want the miso product. This, this product I drew here is miso. So I want to make sure that I get the miso one, not the chiral one. What do you guys think? Is it the top or bottom one that's going to give the target? The second one is correct, yes. Remember, it's anti-addition. So uh, what you, the way you wanna approach these, uh, if you wanna draw the groups on, uh, keep everything in the carbon structure the same and add the groups anti or sin 
based off what you guys know that they do. So if we have this go anti, we're gonna get the meso product. The trick though is, where you, is when you have cis double bonds. So the way you wanna show these is keep the carbon structure the same, but then put the groups anti because we know it goes anti. Then you can do a bond rotation. So basically what I'm doing is I'm rotating this back so it's, a, this, it's your standard zigzag. So your standard zigzag. And we did this before during the Fisher projection stuff. That's not the target. That's different. So there we go. Sterochem concerns. So we got a couple, we had, we had, a, we had a, quite a bit going on in this example here, guys. So I, I showed you guys how to do alkylations, new carbon bond. And then we have two pathways here for getting the meso one versus the chiral one. Okay, I am thinking we are now at a good stopping point. So yes, we are technically going early. So typical uh, press for Orm Ward, you get to go five minutes early today, <laughs> being early. Um, but before I cut the stream, I wanna make sure that, uh, see if you guys have any questions. I'm, I'm leaving this here for a moment because some of you are probably still writing for those of you that are, that are following oh. along. Yeah, so the way, uh, you definitely want to think about this. If you see that they're trying to make a bromine like this, you want to think about, okay, do I want it to be cis or trans? And you have to just work it out this way. There's no other way to work. There's no other way around it, really. Some people do, uh, there is a way to memorize it, but I don't recommend it. I feel, I'd rather you learn it than memorize it. Learn how to do it. That way you don't have to worry about the memorization, right? You just know how to do it. All right, guys, um, give you the moment. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, I'm thinking, uh, so I wanted to mention also, I think in the quiz being due on Sunday, there's gonna be a thing now. So the quizzes from now on will be due on Sunday. Uh, I can't do the final that way though, because the final has to end on the Friday that week. So, but yeah, I think we'll just push everything to Sundays now. It makes things easier for me too, because I'll, I'm actually gonna work on your quiz tomorrow morning. Yeah, this this summer has been nuts. So you guys know how the, how the summer's going, <laughs> so. All right, if you guys don't have any questions at all, I'm gonna go ahead and cut the stream here and then answer questions in the Discord. You wanna go back to 15? Um, what, what about it? 15 was the one that was the multi-step one. This one. The one with all the boxes. Which one did you wanna look at? Do you need me to put the notes back up? Is that what you need? If you need the notes back up, I can just post I can just post a picture on Discord. You need the paper, is that what you're saying? I'll just post I'll just take a picture of it and put it on Discord. That's probably easier. That way you get a better better uh, clear view of it. Alright. All right, guys, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, end this here. Uh, please just go ahead and put your question in the Discord. But yeah, I realized that the, the, the focus was a little off today. So yeah, I'll post pictures in Discord in a few minutes. All right, guys, stay safe.